Amen, amen. It's good to see you 10 o'clock. Don't you appreciate Shane and our worship team up here? Can we just thank those guys for leading us through this last several minutes together? Man, God is good. I love uh, love the team around here. I love what God is doing on our midst. I love celebrating 230 people being baptized in 2018. Doesn't that get you fired up, reminding us of what we're all about, that we exist to reach the world for Jesus one person at a time? Yeah, you, you can get a little more fired up than that with me, right? Like, doesn't that get you fired up? Like, yes, like God is moving. The kingdom of God is expanding, and I love being a part of it with you. Uh, man, some of you uh, were with us on Friday. We golfed in a golf tournament. First time ever we put through a One Heart first annual golf tournament to raise money. We raised over $13,000 on Friday golfing. It was so much fun. You get to play golf and you get to help kids in our city. If you've not heard about One Heart, we'd love to tell you more about it, what God is doing through that uh, whole other organization that God has really established through us as a team. And so, man, I'm excited to be with you today. I believe God's got something really special. You got your Bible out or your Bible app to uh, Matthew. It's the first book in the New Testament, chapter 6, Life and Teaching of Jesus. I want you to get there. Also, get your notes out of your program. Uh, get ready to write stuff down. We love to learn around here. I am, uh, I'm just so humbled. I just love being together. I, I'm just listening to your worship just the last few minutes, man. I just... I just love you, love what God is doing in you, love that God brings us together, love that we have an opportunity to see our city changed together, that we're not just here going through motions together. Don't you love that? Like, we're not here to contentedly just kind of check religious boxes. Like, we actually believe God has plans and purposes for each of us. Don't you believe that? That you are made in his image for his purpose. He has a plan for you, and he's got you here this morning to equip you for that purpose. Like, you're not just like an idol, like kind of a tent at something. You are actually here to be empowered by the God of the universe, to be used by him for the purpose that he has for your life. How cool is that, right? I get fired up. Sorry, I'm fired up this morning at 1030. So you ready to go? Man, I, I think about this series. It's been so fun watching like Shane, didn't he do an awesome job last week helping us understand when I'm attacked, how do I communicate? How do I not defend myself? How do we navigate those kinds of conversations? We've been learning in Spark Star Fires. How do we communicate with each other? How do we communicate really the way Jesus would ask us to communicate? We looked a few weeks ago about how to bring words of hope in the midst of hopelessness or my great and awesome job several weeks ago helping us to understand how to process and communicate in the midst of despair. And today I want to take us, kind of, kind of bring us to conclusion of this ser ser series as we really look at, man, we could have awesome communication with each other. We could do it awesome. Like you in your marriage, like with your kids and your coworkers, your, your schoolmates, your neighbors, like you could kill it right here. But we could be missing a massive, gigantic piece of communication if we don't understand that there is a spiritual realm a spiritual battle that is going on, that we are spiritual beings, and that the God of the universe wants to teach us how to communicate spiritually. It's called prayer. I remember when, when my wife and I were newlywed, we worked um, at a church in, in Tacoma. I don't know if anybody knows Tacoma. It's like our big brother to Spokane. Like, I don't know what happened when God made Spokane and Tacoma, but they are almost identical in so many senses. Like, when, um, when we first moved there, I was 23 years old. My wife was 20, I think. She grew up in, in Coeur d'Alene. I grew up in, uh, like, a 6,000-person white town over in, in the Seattle area, okay? And uh, we get to the hilltop of Tacoma, and we stick out, all right? And uh, we, we were trying to minister to middle schoolers in this part of the city. We had seven, 800 kids coming to this Friday night outreach called Impact, and it was such, a, such an amazing, humbling time, but there was constant tension for us. We were newlywed. We were trying to figure out ministry. We were trying to understand, like, inner city ministry. We were trying to cross, you know, racial divides, gangs, and all kinds of different things were going on in the city at that time. We, we were in over our heads, and the tension in our relationship was constant. Not, not that we were always fighting, but there's just this unsettledness in our hearts. And, man, I felt like communication, we were working hard at our marriage. We were working hard, but the tension just continued to just stay there. And I remember one night. We were in bed, sound asleep, and, and we were both woken out of a dead sleep with this sense of just like kind of heaviness in our room where, where like it was sheer terror, like, like life is over kind of terror, afraid for our lives. And it felt literally like this weight just like pressing us down into our bed, just like overwhelmed by this fear. 
grabbed each other's hands at that point and just began to pray. We just began to cry out in Jesus' name, God, you've got to do something. We have no idea what is going on here, what is happening, but God, you have got to show up. God, you've got to move. Like in this prayer of just absolute desperation, we felt the heaviness start to lift. And as we did, I opened my eyes and I remember looking at the foot of our bed and this dark figure walked out of our room. And it was in this moment that I, I kind of had to take a step back and recognize, wow, wow, we've been fighting this battle in Tacoma for middle schoolers' souls and been missing that this is a deeply spiritual work that God has invited us into. And my fear as we navigate this communication series is that we would get really awesome at communication with each other and miss out on the spiritual realm that God has invited us to have an impact in, that we are spiritual beings with souls in us that are going to live for eternity. The battle that we are waging is much like what Paul describes in Ephesians 6. In fact, it's exactly like this. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord, real life, and in the strength of his might. This is what it says. I want you to see this, Ephesians 6, 10. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, not your own. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to take a stand against the schemes of the devil. The devil is scheming overtime in your life. He's trying to destroy the work of God. You're recently baptized. You're new to real life. You're trying to get your feet wet. You're trying to understand the things and the purposes of God. The enemy is working, trying to thwart God's work in your life. Take a stand, he says, against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Yeah, we communicate with each other, yet we work in this world together. We live together. We, we're married together. We're trying to raise kids together. But this is not the battle. It's not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Communication is essential, right? We are a people of relationship. We've got to learn how to have relationships. Communication is essential for relationship. But God is going, hey, I'm a deeply relational God as well that's invited you into relationship. You've got to learn how to have right relationship with me and communicate with me and understand that there's a spiritual battle going on that you have the ability to have an impact in. And so this conversation kind of, I hope, just kind of pulls back the curtain for some of us. We get stuck in a rut, don't we? We just live our life. We just got our head down. We go to work. We get up tomorrow. We just, we just kind of push the buttons and, and autom- automatically just navigate our way through this life. We need a moment where God can kind of rattle the cages of our hearts and say, hang on. We're up to something different here, something supernatural here. Like we're called to something special. This is not just some ordinary thing that God has invited us into. There's something absolutely extraordinary that God wants to do in our lives, in our city, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces. And and I'm not content, and I don't think you are either, just to kind of play it cool in the here and the now with the flesh and the blood, with the kind of the person to person. I really believe that God wants to open our eyes and give us a passion to have an impact in the supernatural, in the spiritual realm that God has invited us into. So how do we do it? This is where Matthew 6, Jesus is so awesome. He teaches us how to pray. You've got your Bible, your Bible app. Look at it with me, would you? Verse 5, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He says, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, the posers, the wannabes, the people who stand in the churches, the synagogues, he calls it, and on the street corners that they may be seen by others. They're praying out loud. Check me out. See how spiritual I am. Don't pray like those guys. They're posers. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Why are they praying like that? Jesus cuts to the heart of it because they want to be noticed. They want to be appreciated. They want to be liked. They want to be thought spiritual. They got their reward because people noticed them. He says, but when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, pray to your father who is in secret. There's, that's a really cool word for the spiritual realm. It's not, it's not present. Like you don't see it all the time. It's kind of secret. It's hidden at times. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do. Gentiles are these people that worship other gods, foreign, you know, idols. He said, don't do that. They think that they will be heard for their many words, babbling, trying to convince this idol to to bend to their will. Don't do that. Do not be like them. For your Father in heaven knows what you need before you ask him. How cool is that? And when I see this passage, I see Jesus inviting us into a, into a whole nother world, into a whole nother realm. Like there's this really kind of pull back the curtain kind of moment with him and his disciples going, hey, those guys that are praying to be noticed, they're missing it. 
The people that are kind of worshiping idols and chasing all these empty, lifeless gods, they're missing it. You don't got to pray like those guys. Here's how you should pray. Look at verse 9. Pray then like this. Our Father who's in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hmm. Don't you love that just picture of like who God is, where we find our spot in this whole thing? That he's God, we're not. He's the king, we're not. He's in charge, we're not. It's kind of a centering effect here, isn't there? This is how he's teaching us to pray. Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Look at verse 14. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. There's this sense of desperation that just kind of erupts out of the end of this prayer and into Jesus' teaching. God, you've got to give us today's bread. You've got to help us forgive. You've got to, you've got to lead us away from temptation. God, you've got to deliver us from evil. When I see this prayer, there's this clear picture of what I really believe Jesus is helping us to understand that you and I, we can have an impact. We can press into the spiritual realm. We could be a part of something supernatural. We don't got to be content with just living in the natural. How cool is that? And, and I really believe that, that you and I, we, gotta, we kind of have to... Not listen to this sermon in a, in a poor way. Here's what that would look like. You're a Christian. You've sat in the seat for a long time. You've followed Jesus, and you feel the sense of, well, I should be praying more. This, this would ruin the sermon. I, I, I really ought to, I ought to pray more, Richie. Like, I, I, yeah, I got to get after that. I've been, I've been slacking lately. Stop. Just for a second, okay? The other, way, the other way you might miss this conversation, this sermon, is that you might, you might accidentally go, well, I, I'm in, I understand, and I'm good. And, and, and all the while, you have no connection with God himself through his spirit that's been deposited inside you because you've never actually submitted yourself to the leadership of Jesus. Like, the only way that you can have a right relationship with God, Shane explained it a moment ago, is through his son, Jesus Christ, who was willing to sacrifice himself on your behalf, willingly give you his perfection in exchange for all of your imperfection. This is the good news about Jesus Christ, but but if you have not submitted yourself to him, repented of trying to make your life work outside of him and surrendered your whole life to his leadership, then you're not at a spot where you've received the deposit of the spirit of God. The spirit inside you is what seals you for the day of salvation. Don't miss this conversation by sitting in a spot of rebellion from the God of the universe, thinking you've got it figured out. You know what you're doing. This is a conversation that I think is super important for us. So, Jesus, then how do we pray? What does this look like? If you're teaching us how to pray, what does it look like? Well, I think it's pretty simple. Let's break it down together. You got your notes? You ready? First thing is I see Jesus helping us with this. Is he's teaching us how to talk with God. Just write that down. Talk with God. Don't pray like the hypocrites. Don't pray for each other so people notice you and hear you. You ever been preached to in somebody's prayer before? Oh, no. Sorry, I've been around church a lot, so we get these little moments, right? And there's, there's these, these, these temptations is to pray so that everybody around you hears what you're praying. Like, just like talk with God when you go to pray. Like the God of the universe is saying, hey, I want you involved in something supernatural. I want you involved in the spiritual realm. Jesus tells a story in, in, in Luke 11 that is so powerful. He said to his disciples, which of you has a friend who will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. I need some bread. I, a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to, to feed him, to set before him. Listen to this. He says in verse 7, and he will answer from within, leave me alone. Don't bother me. The door is shut. My kids are in bed with me. I can't get up, and I can't give you anything right now. Jesus says, I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, because he likes him, and he's awesome, yet because of his impudence, it's the middle of of the night, right? Like there's this persistence in this guy's, like think of what it would take for him to get up out of bed, friend comes over, middle of the night, go knock on a neighbor's door, hey, you got some food? Like I can't imagine going last night or going tonight, middle of the night to your neighbor's house and making this, this request, but the friend would obviously give him whatever he needs because of this impudence. And I tell you, as a mere mortal, God of the universe, I tell you, ask and it'll be given to you. God of the universe is saying, hey, 
I want you to be a part of something supernatural here. Ask, and it's going to be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be open. What, what father among you, if a son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? For if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. No, nobody does that. If you then who are evil, thank you, Jesus, right? know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Ask, seek, knock. I want you to hear this. Talk with God. He is inviting you to have an impact in the spiritual realm. He's saying, hey, if you want to ask, I, I want to I answer. If you want to seek, you're going to find me. If you want to knock, guess what? The door is going to get open for you. Like, like, Prayer is not this like shame-filled religious duty that you haven't been doing enough of. Prayer is an invitation from the God of the universe to say, hey, I want to have a relationship with you. I want to invite you into something that you have no right into. But because you're my kids, I want you to be a part of it. Because I love you, because I have a plan for you, I want you to see what happens when you and I team up, when our relationship is close and connected, and what could happen in your city through you if you would just surrender to me. Ask, seek, I dare you, knock. Let's see if the door gets opened up. And so many times we carry shame around this conversation. I really believe that God wants you to just talk with them. You don't know, don't, don't get, get apprehensive walking in the door here. Oh, God, I haven't seen you all week. I haven't talked to you all week. Like, none of that. No lightning's coming from heaven, I promise. We've seen some bad people walk through these doors, all right? I'm kidding, okay? And, and, and when, I, when I look at this, I go, God, like, you, you, what an amazing blessing that you would allow us to be with you in relationship to allow, to, to, to be invited into this place where we could ask confidently, where we could seek wholeheartedly, where we can knock, and you said you would open the door. Talk with God. The second piece that I see Jesus doing in the Lord's Prayer here in, in Matthew 6 is this real simple process, kind of a painful process, but we want to write this down. It's called the line with God. Line up with him. Get in line. Understand. How, how does he start this Lord's Prayer? Our Father. My father, who's in heaven, the king of the universe, the one that created this whole thing, spoke it into existence, breathed life into this, this little soul of mine. Yeah, that God, that God in heaven, holy, hallowed is your name, set apart, completely different than the rest of this world. Not like any other God, not like some little kind of wannabe God, like you are set apart above all else. This holy God is the holy God that we surrender to, the one that we submit ourselves to, the one that we line our lives up with. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not my kingdom, my will, my way, my timing. No, God, you are in charge, right? And it's our opportunity as a, as a church, as a family, as a people to say, hey, it's your kingdom, it's your purposes, it's your life, it's your calling, God, that I am submitting myself to. Why is holiness such an important part? Because this is what makes us different. Like everybody else looks like everybody else, but the moment that you and I surrender to another king of another kingdom and, and, and to his will and to his way, we are now set apart. We're different. Understand that this entire world is set up by the enemy trying to drag you away from the purposes of God. This entire world is set up to try to lure you by your sinful nature and your sinful desires to drag you away, entice you, and capture you with your own sinful nature. Man, that's the way the enemy has it set up. And so for you and I to understand that holiness, being with God, aligned with God, and who he is, what his character is, what his mission is, what his kingdom is about, makes us a different people, a peculiar people. We stand out, right? But man, this is so essential for us to align ourselves with the God of the universe. And when I have this conversation, I think about how easy it is for us to align with our circumstances. Man, it's, it's so easy for us to just kind of bend our knee and bow our knee to the waves of life that are crashing on our shores constantly. Forgetting like that, that, that God of the universe is saying, hey, ask, seek, knock. I have power, power that is beyond this world, power to create this world. And here you are, worrying, anxious, fretting over these little tiny things that you're navigating right now. Man, and being interrupted is such a powerful thing. I was thinking about how easy it is to align with our circumstances. I was, this last week, it was like Monday mid-morning, and as a staff team, we were calling everybody and praying with people and talking, responding to all the things that God was doing last Sunday. And I got a phone call, and it was a phone call from a random number in Florida, and I kind of, you know, ignored it, and then I picked up the voicemail later, and, and as I was listening to the voicemail, I just shot it as a text to my wife, and I said, hey, listen to this, it's kind of random. 
There was a church in Florida, a church that we had actually teamed up with, that actually teamed up with us, gave financially to help plant Real Life South Hill. And they were in a kind of a, a situation where they needed some help. Some leadership transition was going on, and, and they had no preaching. They had no support on the weekend coming up. And we're like five days away going, hey, can you fly down here on Saturday and preach all day Sunday and, and then fly back home? That was the request. I was like, well, I'm scheduled to preach on the South Hill, you know, this week. I'm supposed to, you know, this. We're kind of structured. Our, our routine is all set. Our meetings are all set. Like, our, all of this has been set for months. And it was just this, like, kind of rattling of the cage moment. My wife listened to it, and she texted me back. She's like, babe, you need to call him. Now, if you know my wife, I respond with, like, you're right, okay? <laughs> like, you're right, babe. I should, I should not kind of like get out of my little like world that I'm in and how I structured my life and how I want my routine to go and just allow God to interrupt something here. And I called him. And as I was talking to this elder in Florida, it was just absolutely clear God wanted us to go. It's so one of our elders. Um, I asked him, do you like Florida? He said, I love Florida. I said, good, because I got a plan for us. We, we got on a plane Saturday morning at like 5 in the morning, got to Florida at 9.30 at night, East Coast time, barely slept at all, got up early, met with their elders, got to pray with them, encourage them, help them, equip them, walk with them through some of this transition. And then we pre I preached a couple of services there at this awesome church and, and literally walked out of the church, went straight back to the airport, got on a plane, sat on the tarmac for like 45 minutes. Isn't that how it always goes? And then flew back here, got here like 9.30 last Sunday night. And when I look at this interruption, the thing that was so like essential for me in this is that God had something that he wanted to do last week. And I had a really good plan in real life. Like, we have a really good plan around here about what things are going on and how it's going. And it was just like God was so content to interrupt all of our plans, all of our kind of ways about going stuff, and just say, hey, I want you to team up with a, a, a team that cares about the same thing you care about. I want you to kind of minister to another church that's, that's needing some support right now. I want you to not get so sucked into your little world and what you've got going on that, I, that I've got some bigger things going on that I want you to be a part of. And for you and I to understand that God is inviting us to align ourselves with him and to submit ourselves to his kingdom, his priorities as first and foremost in our heart is so essential when we're fighting this spiritual battle. But it is so easy for us to just deal with what we know and what we've got and what we can understand and what we can control and who we can talk to. And we communicate like this all the time and miss. God, you have a kingdom. You're working constantly around this world in my city, in my school, in my neighborhood, in my workplace, in my marriage, God. Some of us have missed what God is up to in our marriage because we have not been submitted to his kingdom. We've been running our life our way. And we've been frustrated with where our marriage is at. And I think about how, how simple it is just to grab your spouse's hand and pray. Now, some of the men in the room are like, like this is one of the greatest challenges for us as men in our, in our homes is just to stop talking, stop defending, stop arguing, and just grab your wife's hand and pray. And so many problems would be solved in our marriages if we would just align ourselves with God. And I think about how easy it is just to get caught up in this life. And the Spirit of God is just wanting to, like, kind of rattle our cages for a second in your life and go, hang on. This is not the battle. It's not, it's not flesh and blood. It's not your spouse. It's not your kids. It's not your boss. It's not that teacher, that professor that you're annoyed at. It's not those guys. It's my kingdom that I'm wanting to advance, and I'm inviting you to be a part of something miraculous. Would you come along? Would you, would you chill out on your agenda and submit yourself to my kingdom? Align with God. You're quiet. You okay? The last thing is this, depend on God. Write that down. Depend on God. Jesus, I love how he wraps up the Lord's Prayer. All right, God, give us today our daily bread. I wish he would give us our monthly bread, don't you? Biweekly bread? Weekly. No, daily. All right, daily bread. Depend on me. God, lead us, lead us not into temptation. Help us to forgive our friends, the people that we're forgiving. We can't forgive without your power, without your love. We can't forgive if we forget where we've come from. The grace of God is needed in our lives every single day to remind us of how, 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 how desperate we are for the, the goodness and the favor of God in our lives. None of us earned it. Shane said it a few minutes ago. We all come into the kingdom at the exact same spot, zero. 
So God, remind me of the grace that you poured out on my life so I can have that same grace for people that I'm in relationship with. God, God, lead me not into temptation. God, deliver me from evil. Every one of these statements is an absolute statement of dependence on God. You want to learn to fight some battles? You want to learn to fight spiritually? It's fought in a place of desperation, not in a place of independence. Man, the world is preaching lies to us, saying, hey, you got to take your life, and you got to figure this out, and you got to work it, and you got to control it, and you got you to you make it happen. And I think about this moment when the disciples were trying to make it happen. A father approached him with a demon-possessed child, and he's going, hey, you got you to gotta help me. And the, the disciples prayed and tried to cast the demon out, and they're like, ugh. And it didn't happen. And so the dad circles around and comes back to Jesus. You can imagine the disciples like, what? I thought we got rid of that guy didn't work, right? Like, we're embarrassed. Like, we couldn't cast this demon out. And Jesus is kind of like, oh, guys, it's okay. Like, this kind, this kind of demon can only come out by prayer and fasting. This kind, this kind comes out under, under my authority, under the, the power of the Father in heaven. Think about dependence. It's admitting that I don't have the power and that God does. What's so important about dependence? It's, it's, it's us leaning into the supernatural power of God who, who has control over the supernatural realm. You and I going to battle in the supernatural realm and our own authority is hopeless. You have no power. You have no ability. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 28 when he's getting ready to send his disciples out when he's going to heaven. He says, hey, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. It's been given to me. Now I want you to go and make disciples of all nations. Listen to what he didn't say. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to you. He didn't say that. No, no, no. It's my authority. And I'm sending you under my authority. The people of God are people who walk under the authority of God, in submission to God, dependent on God. Have you ever wondered why we pray in Jesus' name? You end your prayers like that? Finish, you know, a meal like, in Jesus' name, amen. We just kind of like rolls off so many of our tongues because that's what we learn to do, but you know what that means? Like, like the only power in the supernatural realm belongs to Jesus. His name has all authority, all rule, all dominion. Colossians 1, you got to read it. All things were made by him and through him and for him. He has preeminence over everything. He has authority over everything. And it's only under his authority that you and I have an opportunity to wage war in the spiritual realm. You can't go in there on your own authority. You're not equipped. That's why Paul says put on the full armor of God. Don't put on your own armor. You got nothing. We are absolutely dependent on God when we go in prayer. What's so good about this is we align our hearts with his purposes and we recognize the enormity of what God is wanting to do. He's not just wanting to kind of clean your marriage up and help you guys kind of get along in life. No, he's wanting to transform you. He's not just wanting to like help your kids be successful kids. He's wanting to make them like these massive like church planners or evangelists or people that are changing the world. Like it's gonna take a supernatural element that you can't produce in your kids' lives. Like, we're so content to just operate in the here and the now and, the, and kind of this world. And God's going, no, I want you to depend on me because I have the authority to change things in the supernatural. I can change lives. I can heal marriages. I can make things that you can't make. I can, I can speak things into existence that don't exist right now. You have none of that power. Depend on God. This is what prayer is, right? This is who God's asking us to be as a church, as people that believe that this mission of reaching the world for Jesus, one person at a time, he actually wants us on it. It's not just like a cute phrase that we kind of throw around around here, but it's one that, that, that creates this massive amount of dependency and desperation in our hearts to go, God, the world, really? We have to choose over and over again and go, no, that's your heart, that's not mine. That's what your purpose is, not mine. It's your kingdom, not mine. It's your will, not mine. If that's what you want, God, then I'm in. I'm all in, and you got to show me what it looks like to do my part, what you've called me to do, who you've asked me to be. God, you've got to work out the transformation. God, I'm going to give you everything I've got, but you're the one that's got to heal. You're the one that's got to change hearts. You're the one that's got to do something supernatural, God, right? Like this is prayer, is us depending on God, us aligning our hearts with God, us talking with God, saying, God, we are in, we want to see this world change. We want to see this battle affect, not just in the physical sense, the communication right here, but God in the supernatural realm, God do something miraculous through us. I pray God stirs our hearts today. I, I pray he rattles some cages today. I pray he, he, he moves some of us off of our dime of independence and says, no, I, I've got something special for you. I'm not content to leave you stuck in your own kind of self-righteousness thinking you got it all together. I want something more for you than what you can make for you. Would you come with God today? Man, prayer. 
supernatural, spiritual battle. Like this is what God is saying. I want you to be a part of your life. Don't get content. Don't get sucked into the world's ways and just being successful in this life. Eternity is hanging in the balance for every single person we love. We're not here in this room just to go through motions. We're here to be equipped by the God of the universe to see his purpose worked out through us. God, do something special today. Here's how we respond. One is this, if you don't have a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, you don't have the deposit of the spirit of God inside you. It's time right now to repent, turn from your self-led life and bow before Jesus as the authority in your life. He's the only one that has the power to save you. He's the only one that conquered sin and death on your behalf. No one else can set you free from death other than Jesus. And our invitation is his invitation, really. The good news is this, that you don't got to earn it. You don't got to do anything to, to deserve it. All you got to do is just repent in place of humility. Make him Lord, leader of your life. Respond by being baptized, saying, yes, God, you are in charge. I'm not. It's your kingdom. It's not mine. And that's why we celebrate 230 people being baptized this year, because and those are lives that are being changed for all of eternity. We want you to be counted among that number. We want you to be a part of something supernatural with us on a mission to see this city change. If you would today take that step our team will meet you in the back we've got shirts shorts towels everything you need to take that step today others of us man prayer has been an obligation it's been a thing we should do more and God's stirring our hearts to something greater you say no, no I'm not content you're you, there's a there's a growing kind of hunger inside you to see something massive shift in your own life and your marriage and your kids and your your world that you've been trying to fix up and shape up and God's going no this is a spiritual battle would you ask? Would you seek? Would you knock? Would you allow me to do something special in your life through you, change you, change your marriage? Let's not be a people who are content and satisfied with just what we can fix and what we can navigate. Let's be a people who are desperate for God to do some transformation, right, in our lives and the people around us. Man, if you're at that spot, we're saying, God, you're going to elevate my dependence and my prayer life. God, you're going to change the way I view this world. I'm at a spot of commitment today, God, saying, yes, I want to pray. I want to be a person who, who doesn't just kind of live in this life. I want to fan this flame of prayer in my life. If you're at that spot of commitment, would you just stand to your feet? all over this place today. God, fan this flame, this desire, God, to see your kingdom come, your your will, God, be done in each of our lives, Lord. You're looking out across this room, God. You see an army ready to be equipped for your purposes, ready to engage in a battle, God, ready to push back darkness in this city, ready to become a people that are not satisfied with status quo, God, who aren't just trying to fit in, God, but are coming out of this world, aligning ourselves with your kingdom, your purposes, God, your leadership, your authority, God, dependent on you, desperate for you, God. God, to show up and do the supernatural in our schools, in our workplaces, God, in our families, God. We are desperate for you to do what only you can do, God. And here we make ourselves available, God. Use us as a people who ask, as a people who seek, as a people who knock, God, who come with all of our hearts dependent on you, God. We are a people ready to be used by you, God. Here we stand committed to be a people who fan the flame, God, of your kingdom and your purposes in our life. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, if you're getting baptized, head to the back. We've got people that would love to pray with you. They're coming up right now. Leaders, elders, pastors, get up here. Please come pray with people. Respond. Let's sing. Let's pray. Let's go.